the blessing. We haven't got through the doctrine of rebirth yet. I'm going to spend another hour and a half on it. And uh, discuss now the topic of the new life in Christ. Uh, when Jesus came to the Nephites, they had the law of Moses. Now, the law of Moses is a great law. This whole eye for an eye business has been pushed so far that that uh, kind of a, a heathen law. But Jesus got the first and the great commandment and the second great commandments out of the law of Moses, didn't he? You go back and back of those two great commandments and you'll find that he gets them from Leviticus and elsewhere in the Old Testament. And the law of Moses had a lot of beneficial things to it. But the thing that it lacked was the spiritual transformation. It had the letter, but it didn't have the power. And so when Jesus came to the Nephites, then he says, old things are done away and all things have become new. And uh, he says that then in a very meaningful way. And uh, <clears throat> Nephi gets to that when he, when he talks about a person, uh, uh, he's able to speak with the tongue of angels. Angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost, and you can speak with the tongue of angels. So there's, there's a new life in Christ. And let's get right back to the basics on that. Uh, the prophet Joseph Smith taught some doctrine in relation to that, but for some reason has never really caught on. And it isn't just that it's something out in the eddies of the gospel plan, it's at the very heart and core of the gospel plan. It's the very foundation, and we ought to pick it up, see it, and teach it and utilize it. It has to do with Jesus' statement to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. There in John 3, it begins with uh, the report of Nicodemus, who was one of the rulers of the Jews, the Sanhedrin and so forth. And he came to Christ by night. He didn't have backbone enough to come to him by day and ask a decent question. Those that came to Jesus by day among the Jews in Jerusalem were hasslers either to spy for the Sanhedrin or to badger him and hassle him. And uh, Nicodemus, though, knew enough that he was genuine, had enough of a witness, but then he had his social status to take care of. So he came to Jesus by night. And he starts out very glowingly. He says, uh, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles thou doest except God be with him. That's a great, you know, it's, it's the fanfare that, uh, that uh, you sometimes get that may or may not be genuine and many times isn't. Uh, Nicodemus apparently meant it, but he didn't have the character to sustain it. But even at that, the Savior wasn't very much interested in talking with him on how great he was. <clears throat> he wasn't interested. And he immediately checked it like that and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, he didn't talk about baptism. That wasn't what he was talking about. And he wasn't talking about the laying on of hands for the Holy Ghost. That wasn't what he was talking about. He was talking about born again to see to get your eyes open so that you can see something that before that you hadn't seen, okay? And he said you have to be born again to see the kingdom. Well, that was enough to set Nicodemus off in his mind racing, wondering how a person could be born again. And he asked, hey, is it possible? And it's kind of a challenge to Jesus to go back into your mother's womb and get born again? Now, Jesus didn't uh, handle the issue. He just went on and talked about a new, a new phase of this whole rebirth process. And he said again, verily, verily, and in the Aramaic, verily meant I very positively, and verily, verily, I mean, put a cinch on it. 
Bembley, Bembley, possibly. I, sure, you see that? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom. Okay? Now, it's one thing to be born to see the kingdom, and it's another thing to be born to enter the kingdom, and they're both part of the process of rebirth. Now, what's the difference? Well, the difference is contained in the statement. A person is born again to see, and in the old Bible, and I've, I've got a new set, I'm up with the brethren on buying a new set, but this is like your best girlfriend. You get acquainted, and you know her, and you understand her, and you have a hard time putting her away. <laughs> and so I've still got the old set here. Now, I've got two or three other old sets like this put away in a box with a sign on them that says, Rest in Pieces. <laughs> and this one's just about to that stage now. <laughs> I'm going to have to break down and start using the others. <laughs> All right, so, but the margin on this one says, at the point where he says, Except a man be born again, he cannot see, it has the note, born from above, or you cannot see. Uh, in other words, this rebirth initially of which he speaks is a birth of illumination of the mind. It's to see something that you couldn't see before. And uh, this birth process then precedes ordinances. It precedes the receiving of ordinances. Ordinances, then, of baptism, that is, external ordinances, and the laying on of hands, this is that part of the rebirth process by which you enter the kingdom. You see that? But uh, the prophet Joseph Smith, for example, was once up in the area of Pontiac, Michigan, on a short mission, and while he was there, he stayed in a humble log cabin with uh, the Tyler family. And uh, he held a few meetings there in the evenings. And there was a young tow-headed kid by the name of Daniel Tyler sitting on the front row, just ears and eyes wide open, like this young man down here, see, just listening and taking in everything that was said, see. And uh, the prophet said some things that were so important to him that he remembered that. And years later, in the juvenile instructor, the old juvenile instructor, he writes an article about that experience. And he reports now what the prophet Joseph said. Now, this is not the only report, but this is one. He says, during his short stay, Joseph Smith preached at my father's residence in Humble Log Cabin. He read the third chapter of John and explained much of it, making it so plain that a child could not help understanding it if he paid attention. That's a key to you there, fellow. <clears throat> I recollect the substance of his remarks on the third verse, except a man be born again, he cannot see, and he's put see in italics, the kingdom of God. The birth here spoken of, the prophet said, was not the gift of the Holy Ghost, which was promised after baptism, but this was a portion of the Spirit which attended the preaching of the gospel by the elders of the church. So that the people's minds were enlightened by the power of the Spirit, which came from above. And they were born to see things they hadn't previously seen. And he says, the people wondered why they had not previously understood the plain declarations of Scripture, as explained by the elders, as they had read them hundreds of times. When they read the Bible, it was a new book to them. This was being born again to see the kingdom. Uh, they were not in it, but could see it from the outside, which they could not do until the Spirit of the Lord took the veil from their eyes. Now, can you get that picture there? Now, verily, verily, I say unto the except a man be born again, he cannot see. Let me turn to the teachings here and take two or three other statements uh, on uh, the subject here as the prophet uh, gives them to us. You know, in the Christian world, 
uh, they have the idea of rebirth. A person can, can uh, be born again in the revival tent. And I've had them tell me, I can tell you the exact spot where I was born again. Because I was there and I was listening and the Spirit hit me and I put a peg right on the ground where I was and I know where I was born again. Have you ever had them do that? And, uh, and it's merely then through some kind of spiritual experience that they talk about being born again, okay? And then you go to the other uh, end of the spectrum in the Christian world, and there are those who center such reliance on ordinances that if you are unconscious and the priest administers the last rites, uh, and you're not conscious to ask for anything, and you've been wayward, and you're ahead and not along the broad road to destruction, but you're going cross lots to hell, and something hits you, and you're unconscious, and uh, the priest administers the last rites, then this has efficacy and power in relation to your redemption. And the reliance is on ordinances. Now note how the prophet Joseph Smith put it. He says this, being born again comes by the Spirit of God through ordinances. Have you got that? Being born again comes by the Spirit of God through ordinances. It doesn't come merely on itself. It comes through ordinances. Now let me explain that. Uh, the prophet Yoda Smith wrote a statement of beliefs to the editor of the Chicago Democrat, a guy by the name of John Wentworth. They used to call him Long John Wentworth because he was about six foot seven, and that was pretty tall back in those days. But uh, he publishes the Wentworth letter, and appended to the Wentworth letter is the list of our beliefs, which we call the Articles of Faith. In the Articles of Faith, uh, the third article says what? Anyone want to quote it for me? <laughs> well, let's all read it together then. <laughs> I'll take you off the hook. <laughs> we believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. Now, what's the fourth article? Pardon? We believe that the first principles and ordinances of the gospel are. Now, that's not the way Joseph Smith wrote it. I don't mean to disrupt your faith, but that's not the way he wrote it. And the reason I bring that out is in order to make a point. This is the way he wrote it. The third article is then, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. The fourth article says, we believe those ordinances are, first, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, repentance. Third, baptism. Fourth, the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. The word principles and ordinances, that expression was not there. Now, in other statements that the Joseph Smith made, where he talked about the first principles, he also called faith and repentance principles, see? And so, in B.H. Roberts' day, somewhere around the turn of the century, the issue was taken up. They said, well, Joseph did give it the broader connotation. And so, from that time on, the Articles of Faith say we believe the first principles and ordinances of the gospel are faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what happens then is that we make a dichotomy, a division, and we say faith and repentance are principles, and baptism and the laying on of hands are ordinances. Is that the way we do it? Subconsciously or consciously, that's about the way we do it. Now, let me go back to that original idea. We believe these ordinances are faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is an ordinance. Repentance is an ordinance. Now, what is an ordinance? An ordinance is an official act designed and uh, established in the gospel plan through which 
blessings and power and spirit are given to the individual, right? Now, it requires an official act. And you say, well, what's the official act for, for faith and repentance? And I go to the ninth chapter of Third Nephi, where the Lord says to the Nephites, you shall no more offer unto me an offering of sacrifice, blood sacrifice, but you shall offer as a sacrifice a broken heart and a contrite spirit. This is a sacrifice. This is a ritual. This is an ordinance. You see that? The ordinance of the broken heart and the contrite spirit. And it's that ordinance that we administer in our styles, in the privacy of our own souls, when we actually fully accept Christ and have faith in him. We come to the broken heart and the contrite spirit. And interestingly, there's a beauty about this. You can administer this ordinance in the privacy of not only your own home, but your own soul. No one needs to know of your administration of this ordinance. And you can get, as you offer the sacrifice of a broken heart and a contrite spirit, you can get a flow of power through the spirit. You can get testimony. You can be born from above to see something that you've never seen before. You can see the kingdom of God before you are baptized because you have you have administered one of the sacred ordinances of the gospel, namely faith, and with it that ordinance of repentance. You see that? And with faith in Jesus Christ and repentance, there is an initial flow of the Spirit. And I'm not just talking about the light of Christ business. I'm talking about the power of the Holy Ghost which can come to you. Now, here's how the prophet Joseph Smith explained it. The teachings, page 199, he says, Now there is a difference between the Holy Ghost and the gift of the Holy Ghost. Cornelius, there in Acts chapter 10, received the Holy Ghost before he was baptized. And, and this illuminated his mind, and he could see the kingdom. You see that? He wasn't in it, but he could see it. And he did it because he offered the broken heart and the contrite spirit. He received the Holy Ghost before he was baptized, which was the convincing power of God unto him. And it convinced on a rational, illuminating basis that he could see in his mind and his soul and he knew where the kingdom of God was, see, which he couldn't see before, see. He says, uh, this is the convincing power, but he could not receive the gift of the Holy Ghost until after he was baptized. And had he not taken this sign or ordinance, the laying on of hands, uh, with baptism upon him, then the Holy Ghost, which convinced him of the truth, would have left him. All right? Now, in the rebirth process, then, you begin with the kingdom. And how are you born to see the kingdom? Nephi says in 2 Nephi 33 and 1 that when a man speaks by the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Ghost carries it unto the hearts of the children of men. Didn't say into, said unto. What's the difference between unto and into? Unto is as though he lays it on the doorstep. Into is getting in the house. You see that? Now the power of the Holy Ghost carries it unto the hearts of the children of men. And the Holy Ghost thinks enough of our agency and of our personal dignity that he's not going to force the door through and break it down and put the truth inside. If the truth is going to get inside, you've got to open the door. But the Holy Ghost will carry it unto the hearts of the children of men. And then if you open the door and go out and bring it in, then you've got it. You see that? All right, now when a person then responds to the teaching, when a person teaches by the power of the Holy Spirit and it carries it unto and you open the door, and your mind is open and your soul is right before the Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit bears witness then by your invitation it will come into and this into relationship is an illuminating relationship and you will be born to see the kingdom of god you see that now uh, here's how the prophet put it in another way this is the teachings page 3 uh, uh 28. now these classic statements by the prophet he just had so much to to give and just one sentence is just worth pondering on all day he says, it's one thing to see the kingdom of God and another thing to enter into it. 
Now, what's he referring to? John 3, 3, John 3, 5. You see that? It's one thing to see the kingdom of God and another to enter into it. We must have a change of heart to see the kingdom of God. And that change comes by opening the door and getting the spirit and the transformation and its enlightenment. And that opens the mind to see things you couldn't see before. You must have a change of heart to see the kingdom of God. And he says we must subscribe to the articles of adoption to enter therein. Now, what are the articles of adoption? In the abstract, separate and apart from affinity with any other thing, the term adoption means what? Well, essentially, it's a legal term, is it not? It's the process by which you go, th that you go through in order to bring a person into your family or for a person to enter into a family into which you were not born initially. Now, we have three adopted sons. And uh, we call them improvement on the stock. Uh, we're thankful for them. And in each occasion, as we got them, we then went down to see the judge and went into his chamber, and I got up on the witness stand and was sworn in, my hand on the Bible and all of that. And uh, I committed myself then to, to consider those sons as though they had been born to me in the flesh. Okay? And then through the legal actions that took place, then the judge says, okay, now, so far as the law of the land is concerned, these, this baby is yours as though it had been born into your family. I had gone through the articles of adoption. Okay? Now, in this life, we're born in this fallen state of parents who have the capability to give us physical life. And uh, then if we get our feet under the table for three square meals a day to where the pockets get up to where they're stationary and mature, that's one challenge then of the whole program. But we must be born again. And in this rebirth process, then in order to be uh, admitted into another family, and whose family now are we trying to get into? And the answer is the family of Jesus Christ. We have got to submit to the articles of adoption. And those articles of adoption are faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, repentance, baptism by immersion for the remission of sins, and the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. So that if I have been born of God to see the kingdom by receiving the testimony of the elders, then I've got to be born of water and the Spirit to enter it. So the Spirit mean that being born again, as the prophet says, comes by the Spirit of the Lord through ordinances. Can you see that? It's not the traditional Christian way of just relying on the priest, and it's not the revival way of just getting hit by the Spirit in a camp meeting. It's being born by the Spirit through ordinances. That's the true way, see. Now, that rebirth process can happen and should happen over and over and over again. This isn't a one-time thing. It happens over and over and over again. And uh, it's necessary for it to begin in order for us to truly be spiritually in Christ's kingdom. I grew up in a good LDS home. We were active. Dad was the bishop and all of that, high council and so forth. And uh, I had a love of the gospel. I suspect as I look back on it, maybe from curiosity purposes, uh, he had a good library. And one day I was fiddling around with part of Pratt's Key to Theology. It was one of the tremendous philosophical works of our time. And he says, hey, son, I don't think you better try and tackle that. And, and, uh, and then he went out of the room, and I had some irrigating to do. And, and being a boy... <coughs> And someone saying to me that wasn't quite what I could master, I had the curiosity to try. So I put the key to theology in my back pocket and went out and sat on the ditch bank. I read that key to theology over and over and over again, for I almost memorized the thing. They came out later, later with a new edition, and Polly P. writes rather glowingly with flowery language, and you can just take one phrase out and, and just sentence is still there, <laughs> but, but uh, 
So he writes in that way, and in the new edition, they took one phrase out. And I remember picking up a new edition and looking at it, and I says, hey, this thing is not right. They've left something out. So I went back and checked it out, and sure enough, they had left it out. See. But I loved then that work, and I, I had a, that kind of a curiosity and, and uh, kind of grew up that way in my teenage years on an Idaho farm. And uh, folks used to give me uh, books for birthdays and that kind of thing, you know, The Life of Joseph F. Smith and Ar Bar Barley P. Pass Autobiography and, and uh, all the rest of the church books. When I went into the military, I began my military training the day I was free, white, and 21, down in Camp Fannis, Texas, my birthday on my 21st year. And then we shipped out after that to uh, overseas. And they put us in an old Liberty ship. Whether well, you fellows have ever been in, in a Liberty ship. And I was right down in the bottom of the bottom next to the boiler room. And the aisle was about that wide, and there were nine bunks high, six foot long, with that much of an aisle, and the guy on the top was there with his nose up against the ceiling, and that boiler room just kicked out steam, and there we were, and I was there up about the eighth bunk on that thing for 27 days, going over to the Philippines. And uh, I had my full field pack, I had my steel helmet, my barracks bag, and I took a guitar along with me that I used to play and hauled that over the side there in the Philippines as we climbed down the net 20-foot waves and headed into uh, the beach. Well, when I was going over that 27 days, I took occasion and keep in mind now, I had studied the gospel somewhat an intellectual thing or a curiosity thing as a kid. And here I am now, there, heading all alone in the world, no LDS boys, just all alone. And I got a half a barracks bag full of books, at least a half a barracks bag full. And uh, I'm on my way over to the Philippines. So I take, uh, I take a, uh, a blanket and I head on up to the top side and I climb under uh, a lifeboat, spread the blanket out, and begin to read while the flying fish goes by and the porpoises. But this time as I read, it wasn't for curiosity purposes. This time I was alone in the world. This time I felt kind of a sense of need and I spent 27 days under that lifeboat reading the scriptures. And as I read the scriptures, the neon lamps turned on. It seemed to me as though light and truth and power came from that word. And when I got to the Philippines, I was a different boy. I had been born to see. Now somehow, I hadn't been born to see before, at least not in that way. But when I got there, I had a witness and a testimony about that Book of Mormon and about the scriptures that I had never had before. And it was different than just a curiosity thing of studying and learning. It was a new creature in Christ. And I was different. And thank the Lord for it. Because we went through a lot of hell, we went through a lot of junk. We used to have to stand guard at the prostitute house. I went over to Shanghai, China with a group and and I was the only one that didn't come back infected with venereal disease. A pimp on every corner and several in between and the prostitutes publicly displayed and exhibited in order to all that kind of junk, see. But the testimony of Christ changed and made a difference, see. Now it's that kind of thing we need to do, my brothers and sisters. Now where is the classic statement? Where is the classic statement in the scriptures about being born to see the kingdom of God? Where is it? All right, it's Alma 32 and Alma 33. And don't just stop on Alma 32. Read through and master Alma 33. Because Alma 33 talks about the seed of faith and identifies it. 
what it is and tells us about it. Uh, we all know Alma 32, about planting the seed of faith. And uh, we seldom read, though, Alma 33, which begins in these words. And now, when after Alma had spoken these words, they sent forth unto him, desiring to know whether they should believe in one God, that they might obtain this fruit of which he had spoken, or how they should plant the seed, or the word of which he had spoken, which he had said must be planted in their hearts, or in what manner they should begin to exercise their faith. They wanted to know how to do it. And then what's the rest of the chapter in Alma 33? He cites testimonies, for example, from Zenos and Zenoch and Moses, all of them testifying and witnessing of the coming of Christ. And then having given them those scriptural evidences concerning Christ and his coming, then he says here now in verse 22, uh, cast about your eyes and begin to believe in the Son of God, that he will come to redeem his people and that he shall suffer and die and atone for their sins and that he shall rise again from the dead, which shall bring to pass the resurrection, that all men shall stand before him to be judged at the last and judgment day according to their faith. Now note verse 23. And now, my brethren, I desire that you should plant this word in your hearts. Now what do you plant in your hearts? The testimony of Christ and his divine appointment by the Father and the fact that he gained the mastery and the fact then that you are going to stand on the judgment day before him, and the fact that we can get the benefits of his atonement, see, you plant this seed in your heart. And he says, and as it beginneth to swell, even so nourish it by your faith, and behold, it will begin become a tree springing up in you unto everlasting life. <coughs> now, in Alma 32, he talks about planting the seed of faith, but actually viewed in the sense that I'm trying to get this over here today, this is the formula for rebirth to see the kingdom. Now you start then from a position where you don't see. And so he says now, faith is not to have a perfect knowledge. He says, therefore, if ye have faith, ye hope for things which are not seen, but which are true. Now this has got to be true. You can't do like uh, the the settlers did with the Indians and tell them if you want a gunpowder tree, you uh, take a little gunpowder and plant it and put a fish with it and you'll get a tree and then you'll get some gunpowder. And you can't do that because that is a deception. You've got to act then on hope of those things which are not seen but which are true. Now Christ is true. The atonement is true. His resurrection is true. His divine sonship is true. His appointment by the Father, the man of holiness, and is the Father's indwelling in him, so that the Father is there in glory and in revelatory power. That is true, see. Now plant that in your heart. Accept it. And accept it for what it means, that thereby comes the remission of personal sins. But not only that, that's the preparatory gospel. Thereby then can come the infusion into our lives of his glory, his power, the power by which he raised the dead and healed the sick, and the intelligence by which he spoke eternal words to all generations of time. See, those things can dwell in you and be part of you and open the life within you and not destroy your, your unique personality, but blossom it out into a newness of life in which you are alive in Christ. See, now that's the idea. All right, so he says now, now, you plant this seed. Now, some people think that faith is the first place you start in the gospel. And that's a misconception. Pardon me for saying it, but it is. Faith is the first principle and ordinance of the gospel. In this sense, that you've got to get your life on a foundation of faith. Now, faith isn't just what we believe. Jesus said, if you had faith of a grain of mustard seed, you could say to yonder mountain, move, and it was moved, or to the sycamine tree, be cast into yonder lake, and it would be so. Now, faith is power. Faith first is power in two ways. 
Faith is the power of the human soul to reach down somehow into the very depths of your being and align things up there in your desires, in your hope, in the, in the forces of intellect and the forces of soul and the forces of, of physical energy, the whole thing, and focus it up there on God and ask him in the name of his only begotten son for truth and light and for power and truth. And then through that upward thrust, which is power within your soul, then there is an opening of the veil and the powers of the Spirit come down in joyous revelatory strength and light and truth, and you become a man or a woman of power because the powers of the Spirit begin to flow and dwell in you, see. And so faith then is a power principle in two ways. The power of the human soul then to probe the realm of the unknown. You don't know all that, but you know there's something up there. And you probe the realm of the unknown and you unlock it and you release the truth and the light and the power of the Spirit into your life through the action of your faith and your hope. All right, now, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is the first principle in this sense that you've got to get on that plane. Otherwise, you're not even in the ballpark. But there's something that precedes that, and this is what Alma teaches us here in Alma 32. Note how he says it. Verse 26, Now as I said concerning faith, that it was not a perfect knowledge, even so it is with my words. Ye cannot know of their surety at first unto perfection any more than faith is a perfect knowledge. But behold, if you'll arouse your faculties, that is, become alive, want to know something, get curious, genuinely curious. See, I'll awake. How many times in the Book of Mormon is the word awake? See, awake, awake, get, get alive with it, get with it in your interest. See, he says, but if you will... If you will uh, arouse your faculties even to an experiment upon my words and exercise a particle of faith, yea, even if you can no, no more than desire to believe, let that desire work in you. All right, now where do you start? With faith or with the desire? You start with the desire. And so the way you get going, then, is desire. Now, what is desire? Desire is you simply want something. You want it. And uh, in that sense, then, you're willing, then, to, uh, to work for it. And you're willing to act. And you express that desire. Hey, that would be great. I'd like to have that. I, I hear of Christ, I hear of the gospel, I hear of the restoration, I hear of a modern prophet. I would like to have that. Boy, I'd like to be a part of that. See, that's desire. And if it's genuine and you express that desire, then what does the Lord do? He bears witness that desire is genuine. And he, as it were, rewards you for that desire by attesting to its genuineness by the manifestation of his spirit. And when his spirit attests to and manifests approval of and gives assurance of the word and what you can become as you hear that word taught, then desire matures into hope. For example, here in Moroni chapter 7, you have Mormon saying, how is it that you can how is it that you can attain unto faith, save ye shall hope? Now, what's hope? What's hope in relation to desire? Well, hope is desire plus assurance. Hope has more substance than the desire. Hope has something in it that is coupled with the word assurance. There is a deep feeling that this is not only true and you'd like it, but that you can do it, you can get it, you can achieve it, see. All right, now let's go through the formula. As you express desire, then the Spirit of the Lord comes into your life, and that Spirit enlightens your mind, and you begin to see things that you'd never seen before. And what does that enlightenment of mind do to your desire? 
it matures your desire into hope. You see that? And as you go then from desire through the witnesses of the Spirit that attest to it, this inner testimony, and desire matures into hope, and you begin to act on the basis of desire and hope interrelating your life with the Lord, relying on his Spirit, then and then only are you acting on the plane of faith. You see that? Faith is spiritual power. You see? Now, so you desire, you hope, and desire and hope brings you to faith, and faith then uh, is a power relationship. Peter, for example, as he walked on the water, or tried to, and he did a better job than most of us could do, so let's not criticize him. <laughs> he got a little ways, but I'll tell you this, if there hadn't been some power under him, he'd have sunk the first step, wouldn't he? But he had the kind of power, and he was in union with it, so that there was a platform of the Spirit on which he stood. You know what happened? And then he began to waver. Now, faith isn't something that's constant. Faith, you, you, you can lose faith, and it doesn't mean you lose understanding. It means that you lose this capacity like the mustard seed. The mustard seed is a very interesting. You put it under a slab of concrete and leave just a little crack, and what happens? So that the light can get down to it. Then it will germinate and it will force itself right on up through, will it not? Now, if we could assimilate the powers of the Holy Spirit that are available to us to the same degree in our sphere of life that a mustard seed does in its sphere of life, we would have faith, like the brother of Jared said, to Mount Zaron, move. We want to come through. And the mountain moved. You see that? All right, now, when we talk about the newness of life in Christ, then, we're talking about the newness of the gospel, and the gospel is life. The gospel reveals immortality or brings immortality uh, to light, and it opens not just principles and ideas, it opens a relationship in the spirit where we begin to have something in our lives. And when you get this something in your life, then you get your home teaching done the way you ought to, then you get your service in the church done the way you ought to, so that your service then becomes a barometer of to what extent you really believe. You see that? It becomes that way. Now, there's, there's a difference. There's a difference now between uh, having faith to get the gifts of the Spirit and having faith, for example, to get the fruits of the Spirit. You know what the difference of the gifts and the fruits are? The gifts then are these marvelous supernatural powers, and we're at a kind of a state in the church where we kind of equate talents with gifts, and believe me, it just ain't so, if I can put it that way, and you'll pardon my English, it just isn't so. Talents are one thing, and gifts are another. Now, they can be interrelated, and sometimes they are, but gifts, you don't have a gift of speaking, I mean, talent of speaking with tongues. If you can't speak with tongues unless Something is given to you, right? You can't have a talent to heal. I mean, that's a gift, right? And so uh, gifts and talents are two different things. Now, you can have a talent to teach and a gift to teach. You can combine them in that sense. And you can have a, a talent to learn in that you have learned the disciplinary processes of how to think clearly and accurately. And a lot of people don't know how to do that. They, they, they go too far in their thinking. You have to learn the little story about, about Farmer Brown traveling with the scientist, and the scientist was trying to tell him how to think straight, and Farmer Brown didn't quite know what he meant. He was step overstating himself. And finally, they came to the ranch of, of Rancher Jones. And on the meadow out there, Rancher Jones, in the spring of the year, he had his little woolies, his sheep out there, for all intents and purposes, it looked like they'd been shorn. And so Farmer Brown just said, hey, looks like Farmer Rancher Jones is shorn his sheep. And the scientist took that as an opportunity to teach him something. He said, hey, you can't say that. Farmer Jones says, why can't I say that? He said, well, that's not accurate thinking. 
And so Farmer Brown says, well, what can I say? The scientist says this, you can say this, it appears from this point of vantage that Rancher Jones has shorn his sheep on this side. <laughs> now, have you got the idea? Now, you learn how to think that way, and, and that is a talent. But then as you think and apply, and the Spirit of the Lord comes with the gift of knowledge, then the gift of the Spirit can operate in connection with that, you see. Now, for example, the Apostle Paul talks about the, the difference then between, between uh, the gifts of the Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit. And uh, before getting there, let me just turn over to, to Ether chapter 12 and read you one here to kind of focus in as Moroni and this glorious statement of Ether 12. One of the great chapters in the Book of Mormon talks about the Gentiles in this way, and in verse 28 he says, Behold, the Lord speaking now to Moroni, Behold, I will show unto the Gentiles their weakness, and I will show unto them that faith, hope, and charity bringeth unto me the fountain of all righteousness. Now, what finally brings you to Christ? Is it theological knowledge? That's great. I would be the last to knock it. But I've had to learn, sometimes the hard way, that theological knowledge is not synonymous with some kind of true relationship to God. Faith, hope, and charity bringeth to Christ the fountain of all righteousness. You see that? Now, knowledge and understanding helps, and it helps your faith, and it helps your hope. It gives you something to have greater hope in and all that, because hope is a cyclical thing, and it's spelled with a C. It's cyclical. You have hope, you express it, you get the benefit, you have hope on a greater plane, and you get it, see? All right, but there's a difference now between between the gifts of the Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit. And over here in 2 uh, Corinthians, I mean 1 Corinthians, rather, 13, the Apostle Paul puts it this way, Though I speak with the tongue of man and of angels, and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could move mountains and have not, I am nothing. Okay? Now, you can have all those things and not have charity and end up with nothing or as being nothing. That's the point I want to make. That you can have that kind of faith, to have that kind of knowledge, that, that kind of power to move mountains and still end up as nothing. And you say, well, if I got that much of the Spirit, I ought to have something. But if you read what the Lord says on the day of judgment, there'll be many who will come to him and say, have we not done great mighty, mighty things in your name, healed the sick, raised the dead, etc., etc.? And he's going to say, depart from me. You don't even know me. Now, analyze that for a minute. Faith is something that's largely centered in the individual. It's that capacity, I've said, to reach down to align the forces of desire and of hope and the powers of soul, the powers of intellect, of mind, and even the physical powers, and combine them like a, like a magnifying glass does with sunlight and focus them, just focus them and probe into the realm of the unknown and then release through that upward thrust the powers of the Spirit in your life revelatory in their nature and powerful in their nature to perform mighty works through the Spirit. Now, faith in that sense is essentially something that's centered in me as a person. It's my capacity by desire and understanding to do that. Now, because I can do that doesn't mean I've got charity. It means I have the Spirit of the Lord and hopefully some of that stuff will rub off on me and I'll get this love of God in my life. But it doesn't necessarily so that that's, say that's true. Now, when I do that then, and I do those works of righteous, then I, righteousness, and then I go the next step, and the next step is consecration and obedience. Get yourself in line with the living prophet. Get yourself in line with your bishop. Get yourself in line with your state president. And commit yourself then 
to a consecrated life to build the kingdom under the keys that the Lord has given to us. Now, when I take those gifts then and I put them on the altar of consecration and I say, Lord, these are yours. This is not an ego trip. One thing a person teaching religion has to guard against is he finally gets falls in love with his own voice. Seriously. You fall in love with your own voice and with being on the spotlight and people saying ooh and ah. And you finally have to forget that stuff. And know then where your strength is and know where the mercy comes from and know where the power comes from and then know that in the final analysis it's the covenant of consecration that takes you through the veil into the presence of God. And when you take that which God gives you as a gift of the Spirit and you consecrate it and you genuinely put on the altar in a genuine unfeigned expression of, of love to him, this is yours, you gave it to me, I now give it back to you to help build your kingdom. Then and then only does he give you his love. Then you have that sacred fruit of the Spirit which is called charity. And it is a gift of God. Some people think that, that charity is my love for Christ. No. Charity is the pure love of Christ. Underscore the word of. It's his love. It's the love he has in his bosom. It's the attribute he has received from the Father. I don't have it until he gives it to me. And he doesn't give it to me just because I have faith. Uh-uh. He doesn't give it to me just because I have faith and do mighty worlds and can do things. He gives it to me when I'm ready to consecrate and when I do. Now, Lucifer didn't learn that. Lucifer learned the processes of faith. He became a great personality in faith. He wielded great power. He was a mighty orator, and he could do the works of faith. But he was egotistical. He wanted to exalt his throne above that of the Father. He would not consecrate. He wouldn't put it on the altar. And so the love of God could never be forged and fused into his soul. And his vanity and his egotism got the best of him, and he finally fell. Now, there's a difference, my brothers and sisters, between having the gifts of the Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit. Now, I have some of the gifts of the Spirit, one of which is the gift of knowledge, and it's nothing to do with me. When I read the scriptures, the neon lights turn on, and I see things that I even run to my colleagues and say, hey, if I, I say, I don't see that. And yet I know what the spirit of revelation is, and I know the Lord's revealed it to me, and I can see it. And it's been one of the greatest burdens in my life to handle that gift. Now, my wife has the gift of charity. It doesn't come across so much flash and flower but over and over again, I see relationships in my life where as we live through the relationships of life and community existence, service, and so forth, where I just literally die inside because I haven't got what she's got. And I know what the difference is between the gifts and the fruits, and she's got more than I've got. And so I'm glad to have her because she's teaching me a lot more than she thinks she is, see. Now, that's the spiritual life of the gospel, see. Now, that, that spiritual life should come to every person. Some people think, for example, that women should just have babies and honor their husbands. And I suggest you do both. <clears throat> but believe me, I don't want a dumb blonde as a wife. However attractive she may be, what I want and what I've got is a woman of faith who's not only got the gifts but the fruits in her life. See, Now, can women have the gifts of the Spirit? Prophet Yoda Smith once spoke to the Relief Society sisters <clears throat> here in 324 of the teachings. 
And he quotes the statement by uh, uh, the uh, gospel writer Mark concerning the results that flow. I said 324, it's 224. That flow from faith. These signs shall follow those that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, and they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. I'll note the prophet's commentary. No matter who believes, these signs, such as healing the sick, casting out devils, etc., should follow all that believe, whether male or female. Okay? Now, should women have the gifts of the Spirit? They certainly should. We have a situation where at times we, and it's proper to equate the gifts of the Spirit with priesthood gifts. But what we've done, if I can just be a, an observing person, I don't mean to be critical, but what we've done is that we've kind of gathered those gifts into the priesthood so that a person who has a calling draws on the gifts and he uses the gifts. And we kind of equate priesthood gifts with spiritual gifts because the priesthood uses the spiritual gifts and thereby makes some priesthood gifts, okay? You see what I'm saying? All right, now the gifts of the Spirit then are independent of priesthood. Uh, they are given to the sisters. Are they given to children? What's the great example of the Book of Mormon? Ask yourself this question. Who taught the Nephite people the greatest truths that they ever heard. Include in that the ministry of Christ and his personal ministry to them. Even including that, who taught the Nephite people the greatest truths? And what's the answer? Their children. You remember there in 3 Nephi? Where the children spoke things of greater import and depth and meaning than even Christ himself taught them. Now you say, well, that was an exuberant thing, but they couldn't do that without the Lord giving them the powers of the Spirit. And those powers of the Spirit then were given to those kids. And who were those kids? They were boys and they were girls. And why did Mormon include that in that Book of Mormon? That's a tailor-made book. Why did he include that? As an example that the gifts of the Spirit have no restriction as to who can receive them. And every person ought to receive the gifts of the Spirit, including children, the sisters, and hopefully some of us dim bulbs of brethren can get a few of them ourselves too. You see that? And that's the idea, that we get then the gifts of the Spirit. And then what's the great goal and the great objective that we're shooting toward? The great objective that we're shooting toward <coughs> then is not to build a well-oiled piece of machinery after the pattern of a fine-tuned Gentile corporation. We must minister the gospel, not merely administer the great ecclesiastical system. You minister by building the substance of faith, the spirit and its gifts and its blessings in the people. And the great ideal is fourth Nephi. You don't have to have too much said. Uh, to show the pinnacle of gospel existence. And the book of Fourth Nephi isn't very long of a book, is it? But it does give you a clear and distinct picture. Note, for example, what it has to say. Beginning with verse 2, And it came to pass in the thirty and sixth year the people were all converted into the Lord upon all the face of the land, both the Nephites and the Lamanites. And there were no contentions and disputations among them, and every man to deal justly one with another, and they had all things in common. Now, don't say Christian communism there. We're going to talk about the law of Zion here tomorrow, but uh, all things in common merely is another way of saying all things in Christ, with your own personal stewardship and your own personal individualistic program of economics. So they had all things in common, therefore they were not rich or poor bond or free, but they were all made free and partakers of the heavenly gift. And he goes on to say, as he speaks of that here in verse 7, the Lord did prosper them exceeding the land, as much as they did build cities and so forth. And then he goes on and says, uh, 
And there was no contentions among all the people in the land, but they had mighty miracles wrought among the disciples of Jesus. See, Now that's 4th Nephi, and it's based then on a, a regenerative program where rebirth then becomes meaningful. Now in the Book of Mormon, what is the major sign of apostasy? Let's get at the gospel in that sense. In the Book of Mormon, what is the major sign of apostasy? If you had to point to one apostasy, one, one sign. Well, it's not lack of church attendance. The Ramiumptomites, for example, attended every Sunday and got up on the Ramiumptom and said how great they were and how thankful they were the Lord had made them better than anyone else. They were a special people. All right, now what then is the chief sign or the, the most, the most uh, uh, evident sign then of, of apostasy? All right. It's pride uh, and the loss of the gifts. It couples together pride and the loss of the gifts. Now, for example, let me, let me turn here to uh, uh, the words of Mormon, uh, the Book of Mormon, chapter 1, where Mer Mormon now is dealing with his apostate condition in, among the Nephites in his day. And he says this, But wickedness, this is verse 13 of chapter 1, Wickedness did prevail upon the face of the whole land, insomuch that the Lord did take away his beloved disciples. And the work of miracles and of healings did cease because of the iniquity of the people. And there were no gifts from the Lord, and the Holy Ghost did not come upon any because of their wickedness and unbelief. What's the, tr the critical sign? Loss of the gifts. Over here earlier in Nephite history, the little book of Jerem is an interesting little record in the uh, Book of Mormon, and uh, it has this one brief little statement here now concerning uh, the, uh, the spiritual condition among the people. We're talking here about Jerem uh, verse 4. He says, And there were many among us who have many revelations, for they are not all stiff-necked. Now, what's the flip side of the coin on that one? If you're not stiff-necked, then what? You'll have many revelations, right? I'm not talking about Ezra Taft Benson having them. President Benson can have them and does. I'm talking about us receiving them in our sphere. And he goes on to say, And as many as are not stiff-necked and have faith have communion with the Holy Spirit which maketh manifest unto the children of men according to their faith. And so if you're living in tune with the Spirit of the Lord, you'll have the gifts of the Spirit. Here's how the prophet Joseph Smith put it. This is the teachings, page 270, where he's talking about it. And he says this, and this is one that really hurts. I mean, it just it cuts right to the level of many of us too much. He says, uh, uh, because faith is wanting, the fruits are. Uh, no man, since the world was, was, had faith without having something along with it. The ancients quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sore. Women received their dead. By faith the worlds were made. A man who has none of the gifts of the Holy Spirit has no faith. And he deceives himself if he supposes that he has. Faith has been wanting not only among the heathen, but in professed Christendom also, so that tongues, healings, prophecies, prophets, apostles, and gifts then are wanting and lacking, see. Now, ask yourself the question, when was the last time you had a personal revelation? Well, it's just about the last time you had the gospel in your life. When was the last time you had some of the gifts of the Spirit? When I was uh, initially at BYU, uh, they put me on the high council. This was years and years ago. And uh, in that high council relationship, I had my membership in the BYU 11th Ward, over which Truman Madison presided as bishop. Now, Truman and I were both members of the College of Religion. We both generally understood the gospel. And uh, as a member of his ward, I went to him one day and says, Truman, I've got to have a temple recommend. He says, okay. 
come on in. So I went in and sat down in his office. And he started out this way. He says, would you like me to ask you my ten questions or the church's ten questions? Now, this is typically Truman, for those of you who know him. And being just a little bit confident, I says, why don't you just shoot the works and ask me anything you want to, Bishop? So he says, okay, I'll start with my ten. Do you live in such a way that at least one of the gifts of the Holy Ghost is functional in your life. Well, you know, I've never had a problem with an interview until then. Now, I knew the theology. I knew the theology, and I knew that I didn't have the gifts. I really wasn't there. I wasn't in the ballpark. And I got my finger under my collar, and I stretched it, and my mind raced over the scriptures, and I finally landed on section 46 where the Lord says one of the gifts of the Spirit is to believe in the testimony of someone else. <laughs> <laughs> and so I says, yes, Truman, I, I believe I can say I have one of the gifts functional in my life. I believe when the prophet speaks, and that's it. <laughs> okay, so he goes on to the second question. Do you live in such a way that charity, the pure love of Christ, is the guiding and the undergirding power in your family? And wow, I get hit again. Now there's the kids, you know, and they get riled and, and you kind of, <clears throat> and uh, there's some strain with you and your wife. And, uh, and that isn't just that. Do you really live so that the flow of the Spirit with the love of Christ is there? And boy, I, I just cringed again all over. And he could see my discomfort, so he didn't require me to answer that one too much. And he moved on to the third one. Question three. Do you pray in Spirit so that you receive in Spirit? Section 46. And I remembered how I'd prayed the night before, you know. It was almost like saying, Lord, I've said this doggone thing over before. Why don't you just put ditto on it <laughs> and take it? <laughs> I'm a little sleepy. <laughs> now, I didn't quite get to that point of crassness, but sometimes our prayers are that mechanical. Pray in spirit is to pray so that you, there's an upthrust, and then there is a downflow. You pray in spirit and you receive in spirit, see? Well, when he got through that third question, I says, well, you know, Bishop, I'm sure that you're a busy man. <laughs> and why don't you just ask me the church's ten questions? <clears throat> and so he could see my discomfort. And so he says, okay. And he shifted gears. You pay your tithing, yep. Treat your wife, yep. Support the brethren, yep. Uh, attend your meetings, yep. I just went through them, just zip, 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 picked up my recommend and walked out. That was before the Provo Temple was built, and we went to the Salt Lake Temple right after that. I walked into Temple Square, looked up those sacred spires, and I stood there for a long time. And I wondered whether I was worthy to go in, because I was not really sure that I had the gospel in my life. I had the theology. I knew what it was to be born again. Maybe I was a little oversensitive, and sometimes I am. Because the Lord's been very patient and loving to me ever since I was a kid. I've never known the time when I didn't know the gospel was true. But uh, looking at that temple and looking at the spires and the sacred atmosphere there, and having gone through that interview, I seriously re-examined my life in relation to whether I was on the gospel program, really. And finally, I saw someone else go into the temple. I knew darn well wasn't doing any better than I did. So I followed him. <laughs> now, I never have found what those other seven questions are. <laughs> but I can tell you the gist of the thing is, the gist of the thing is that if you have the gospel, you'll have the gifts. But you can be damned with the gifts. You've got to move on and partake of the love of Christ.
and that love comes from him. And let me conclude with Moroni 7, uh, where he gives us a classic statement on how you really become sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. And note how he puts it here, beginning with verse 7, 47 rather, he says, but charity is the pure love of Christ. It's his love. It's what he possesses. And I want it. And the only way I can get it is through the consecrated life. See? But it's his love. Charity is the pure love of Christ, and it endureth forever. And whoso is found possessed of it, at the last day it shall be well with him. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, Pray unto the Father with all the energy of heart. And let me just say, if it's only 99 and 9 tenths percent, it's not enough. Pray unto the Father with all the energy of heart that he may, that she may be filled with this love which he hath bestowed. It's a gift. It's a bestowal. It's an anointing. It isn't something that you think of and generate in your own life. It's an anointing. Which he hath, that you may be filled with this love which he hath bestowed upon all those who are true followers of his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, that's where you find the true and the superficial followers. That's where you separate them. He says that, uh, that you may become the sons of God. You don't really become children of Christ. You might, through baptism, get an initial primary relationship. But you don't really get that inward cleansing, and with that inward cleansing, the love of God to where you are truly a son or a daughter, see, that you may become the sons of God, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and that we may have this hope, that we may be purified even as his, he is pure. Now that's the situation, my brothers and sisters. That's what the gospel is, and you can't separate that from church activity, and you can't, for the life of you, separate that from total, uncommitted support to your priesthood leaders. You can't do that. I don't care whether you think they're right, wrong, or indifferent. You can't do that because God honors that channel. And as I said the other day, the keys of the priesthood constitute the gospel administratively. That's one way you get the powers of the Spirit in your life, by going to your bishop and saying, Bishop, I love you, and I am going to work to the best of my ability in the program the Lord calls me through you to do. And I don't care whether you get inspired to be called or not. That's not the issue. The issue is you've got the call, and you do it now. And when you get this, then you are born to see, you are then are born to enter, and you begin to grow up as a new creature in Christ, and you begin to partake of the fruits of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, and you have a life that begins to unfold and blossom, and it doesn't destroy your individuality and unique personality. It just blossoms it out, and you grow up in Christ. Now, may the Lord bless us to do that. Anyone who's been part of the way along there knows that that divine program is true. You know that it's true, and I know that it's true. I know that it's true by the revelation of Jesus Christ and by some things even beyond and above the normal revelation of Christ that reaches up into the blessings beyond the veil. He is real. He is the most real and alive person there is in this universe. I know that, and I know that as well as I know that I'm alive, and I bear you that testimony in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, we didn't leave much time for questions. <clears throat> if you have a few, maybe we can honor it before we run. Please elaborate on the third part that fell. Isn't a third, uh, isn't a third a third? How could you have been misled on this? What does it really mean? How can we have been misled? Well, it isn't a matter of being misled. It's just a matter of growing in the understanding of what the gospel says. Now, there's two places in the scriptures where it deals with this subject of the fall. One is section 29 of the Doctrine of the Covenants, and the other is Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. And it says, uh, 
Uh, Lucifer came unto me and said, Give me thine honor, which is my power. Note honor is equated with power. That's another whole subject. And also a third part of the hosts of heaven turned he away from me because of their agency. A third part. Now, go back to the sheep on the meadow. What does a third part mean? Don't read into it anything but what's there. What does a third part mean? A part is a unit. It has nothing to do with a fraction. It's there's three units. One, two, three. Can I say you folks fell? <laughs> okay. Now, there's, I say that because they're smaller, see? And it doesn't have anything to do with, with the number. Now, every time the scripture speaks of that, it speaks of it in that terminology. For example, here again. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven. Okay? Now, if you've got faith enough to ask the Lord about what that means, then the Lord bless you. But that's what the scripture means, and that's as far as I would like to go. All right, what does the word prophetess mean to you? There are some in the church who feel that prophecies is the same as a witch. Well, a prophetess, see, Joseph Smith used to emphasize Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, where John is told that the spirit, that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And then he used to reason this way. If you have the testimony of Jesus and you get that by the Holy Ghost, that constitutes the spirit of prophecy. And if you have the spirit of prophecy, that constitutes you a prophet, right? And so he says to the sectarian world, if you've got the testimony of Jesus, you all ought to be prophets. And because I say I'm a prophet and you say I shouldn't be one, actually you are saying something that's contradictory to the scripture, see? Now, if I have the testimony of Jesus, and the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy and gives me a testimony of him and also opens to view some of the things of his work, that there's going to be a great millennial kingdom, that there are going to be other things, see? This begins to get into the realm of prophecy. And I am a prophet to the extent and to the degree I have that testimony. Now, can that testimony be given to women? And the answer is yes. And are they, are they the finer souls of the kingdom or are they witches? They're the finer souls of the Canaan. And blessed is every man who has a prophetess as his wife. Okay? <clears throat> That's the way it is. Is that the end of it? Okay. Well, again, thanks a lot. We'll come back. Uh, let's hurry and get to dinner because we've got a whole batch more. We're going to run out of time. Did Christ have more intelligence in his spirit body than all other spirit children combined. And the B.H. Roberts turned over to uh, uh, Abraham chapter 319, I think it is, if I, it's been years ago since I read him on that, but I think that's it, where, you know, where the Lord says this, uh, uh, and the Lord here speaking now is Christ, and it's the pre-earth Christ to Abraham. These two facts do exist that there are two spirits, one more intelligent than the other. There shall be another more intelligent than they all. I am the Lord thy God. I am more intelligent than they all. Now, B.H. Roberts said all compositely as well as any person individually. See, now that is true in two ways, if I can just take the time to explain that. There's power that comes through covenant. There's rights that comes through covenant. There's a flow of the spirit or of glory that comes through covenant. And it's one thing for a person to just be a bright mind. And it's another thing for him to have the mantle of a calling. Now, any person who's been a bishop or state president knows that, that there is a mantle and that that mantle brings uh, the spirit of revelation and knowledge and wisdom and judgment, discrimination, Love, there's, a, there's, there's something there that's real and that's meaningful, see? And that person who has that mantle then has intelligence that he doesn't have as an individual. Now, similarly, in a similar way that was true of Christ, because he entered into a covenant relationship with the Father, then the flow of the Spirit from the Father to him was greater 
than the flow of the Spirit to all others combined, because he is appointed to be the revelation of the Father, you see. And uh, uh, they were spiritual power that came to him, and he had, he had access to spiritual power and to glory, even more than the Holy Ghost did. Not just in the sense of one person versus the other, but in the sense of office and mantle. You see that? And the benefits that he got then by his relationship with the Father were great and greater than any other, see? And in that sense then, yes, he had, he had more intelligence than all of us combined, and still does, believe me, he still does. Thanks a lot.